Hi. <laughs> so, bit of a departure from the Warcraft videos, but just seen Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens, and how could I not do a little review of this? First thing to say is do not worry, I am not going to re reveal any plot details at all. Uh, many of you may have seen this already, uh, some of you may not have done, don't worry, I'm not going to give anything away unless it was in the trailers and pretty clear from that. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about plot too much at all. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we've all got to be fans of Star Wars, we're fans of Warcraft, we're usually that. Um, very few people I've met that are not. And, and usually those people are just people who haven't seen Star Wars um, very few people who've seen it and not liked it that I know of. And I, I'm going to start out with the theatre experience, the cinema experience, because this is, you know, it's not a DVD film. <laughs> you know, we'll be watching that later. This, so the whole theatre experience is... And, and I didn't go out and see it on the release day. I waited a couple of days. I waited to watch it on, you know, some, first showing on Sunday morning, thinking, hoping against hope that it'd be quite quiet. Of course, it was never going to be quiet. But at least hoping that the people going there would be like people like me, the ones who remember the original uh, trilogy when it was being shown, although I don't remember the very first one because, you know, 1977, I'd only just been born. <laughs> I was like a year old. Um, but I remembered the other two at the cinema. And uh, I was very young with Empire. Very young. And, uh, and of course, I've seen the, the prequels as well. So the theatre experience... I, I thought, and it, it started off like that. I got in nice and early, good, like, 35 minutes early. Um, booked my ticket, because although I was hoping it'd be quiet, I sort of knew it wouldn't be. Um, so booked it, went, put the card in the reader to get the ticket out. Oh, that's not working, that's good. So I went to the kiosk anyway, got the ticket there. And, um, yeah, straight in, got a seat that I liked, nice and in the middle. And like, mostly it was like you know, couples or the odd person like myself uh, in the 30s and 40s who do remember that. And I thought, this is going to be all right. Then the, the kids started coming. I thought I'd hoped to avoid that. I knew I could have avoided it if I'd have gone to like a late show and a midnight show. But then you get all the, the, the younger ones pissing about with lightsabers and cosplay, which I've got nothing wrong with, but they tend to whoop and holler when they see scenes they like. And I, I want a quiet, I want people to shut the, the hell up. Um... So I wanted to avoid all that business. So yeah, the kids started coming in. And, and what I noticed was the ones who came in later on, when there's like 15 minutes left to go, tended to be the ones who seemed pickier about where to sit. If you're really picky about where to sit, why don't you come in earlier like I did? And, and one thing that nearly blew me away, 10 minutes to go. So the, the thing's filled up nicely. 10 minutes to go. A family of six comes in. And they're looking around, I'm thinking, D -d did you think that you could come in to watch a film on the opening week that is a new instalment in what is arguably the biggest movie franchise ever? D Ten minutes before it starts, did you think there was going to be six seats together? Hmm? And at first I thought to myself, this is really weird, I can't think like them. Then I thought to myself, actually no, this makes perfect sense. Because, yes, two people that are really badly bad at planning, they would have four kids, wouldn't they? Yes, of course they would. So, ugh, you saw that. Then I saw another little kid come at the, the front with a lightsaber, and I thought, oh no, he's going to be lighting that up. To his credit and to his parents' credit, he didn't, he was good as gold. So that was fine, but I did fear this red lightsaber waving around. If it was going to be any colour, at least it was red. It's my, my favourite colour for the lightsaber. Big Vader fan, you know. And um, as you can probably see. <laughs> and I thought, oh. But yeah, he was fine. There were a couple chirping behind me. They were one chirp away from me saying, can you shut up, please? Uh, before they just stopped completely. So that was fine. But, I could, oh. but yeah, then the film started and... and it was um, it was absolutely fantastic. I sort of went in with high hopes because the reviews were so positive. But, you know, what one person thinks is a good film, you may not. There's plenty of other films had great reviews and I've watched them and gone, oh, no. So, but it, well, it is great. Go and see it. And uh, new talent in it, new characters, therefore new actors we've been introduced to. Did, did fantastically well, fantastically well. What was really weird was that 
three new what we would call rebel characters on the rebel side they're not called the rebel in the, the it's not the rebellion and the empire in this it's it's two different things i'm not going to say what they are though because i'm not sure that's a huge plot spoiler but i'm just i'm not going to say anything that wasn't in trailers and i don't remember uh, the organization should we say being mentioned by name in the trailer so i'm going to steer clear of that one and, and we're used to the idea, aren't we, that, that British guys play the fellas on the dark side and, and Americans play the fellas on the light side. And that's it's, it's so ingrained in the in the law that even Star Wars The Old Republic, um, if you play a, like a, an Empire character, an Imperial character, it's voiced by British actors. And if you play like a Republican character, it's voiced by American actors. It's such a such an in-joke there. Um, and for you Americans as well, I mean, you might just think it was random British guys they got playing these parts as well in the original trilogy it wasn't at all like for british people british people who were around at the time we recognize these guys uh, they might have only had a few lines a bit part on it but a lot of them were actually quite famous on on the telly though not necessarily film famous some of them were peter cushing of course and richard glover in empire um but yeah a lot of other ones as well and uh, but yeah it just became so much of a joke i mean i know on the sort of rebel side you had sir alec guinness obi-wan and you had anthony daniel c-3po but by and large it was american actors and on the dark side yes you had james earl jones voicing um but it's still a british guy inside the vader suits but james earl jones voicing it uh but by and large but of the three i would say the three new rebel characters one was american and two were british it was like whoa this is weird um but the British are still flying the flag for the dark side, though, so it's all right because all the new dark side characters seem to be British. Certainly the main ones. <laughs> and so, yay. <laughs> the distinction's still sort of there. It's just been a bit muddied a little bit. Um, and I thought as well, because, I mean, it's a long... This sort of... It's a long time since the prequels, for a start. New installment is a long time. But this doesn't follow from the prequels. This follows from episode six. It's 32 years ago since we saw that for the first time, since I saw that for the first time. So you think it's a bit like when you go and watch a film of a book you really enjoyed and you think, and, and, and in a book, of course, you can do it at a different pace. A film, you've got to get straight into the action. But there's a lot of characters to introduce. And they're not going to make the film so that you have to have seen the original trilogy. It's better if you have. But if you haven't, you can still follow most of the plot. And you can still enjoy, I think you'd still enjoy the film if you're a fan of this sort of thing. You don't even have to be a fan of sci-fi. It's just you, we all know this, the Star Wars fans. The themes of it are not just about sci-fi and fantasy. In fact, it's more fantasy than sci-fi. I would say it's really like King Arthur in space. Really, I always thought about it. It's the original trilogy, um, you know, with Obi Wan as Merlin and Luke as, as Arthur uh, and Vader as Uther. Uh, you know, um, but anyway, the. Um, but yeah, so I thought either they're going to do like a narration thing for a few minutes where they bring everyone up to speed like they did in Lord of the Rings, or it's just going to be a slow burner for half an hour while they get all the pieces together, then go for it. I'd have been okay with that. I'd have forgiven them that as long as it was really good later on. But not a bit of it. Straight into the action. And, it, and they didn't rush introducing the characters. They introduced them a bit at a time. And, and it never f dragged at all. It's an absolute triumph of a film. I cannot... I cannot commend it highly enough. It was amazing. And, and out of the new actors, I would say my special mention would go to John Boyega. Um, now, a lot of the critics have praised Daisy Ridley, and rightly so. She does a fantastic job. They all do a great job. But old John Boyega, he, he, he is my pick. And the reason for this is he's made history. He's made history. How, I hear you ask. Simple. This is the seventh installment. And he is the first, per and this is the only slight plot thing I will say, but it was clear in the trailers this is going on. He is the first actor ever, ever, to play a stormtrooper that can hit the broadside of a barn. He shoots things and hits them. <laughs> Not used to this. They're breaking barriers. Stormtroopers who can shoot things. <gasps> Granted, he does a lot of it when he's not a stormtrooper anymore, but by the by, that's the last plot thing I'll talk about. Um, so, yeah. And now with the, the prequels, I'm just going to compare them to the original trilogy and the prequels. Now, the prequels, a lot of people say they were bad. I don't think they were bad. They just weren't up to standard. 
they were bad by comparison to actually they weren't even bad by comparison to the trilogy uh, by comparison to the original trilogy they were bloody awful um, they episode one started fantastically didn't it didn't it? It's, it started exactly as you'd want to start it. We had this little space scene in orbit around planet, as you always do. That's like the signature. And then you had um, the Jedi come on board, and you've got this guy in, on the bridge, the Trade Federation guy, shitting himself because the Jedi are coming. And he's going, oh, my God. they're going Because you've got to remember, in the original trilogy, the Jedi were not so much a joke, but mocked a little bit because they'd all been destroyed by Vader. So no one feared them anymore. They weren't this force, in, no pun intended, this force in the galaxy anymore. Um, and then episode one, of course, he's going back to the time when they were. There were lots of Jedi and they were powerful as an organization. They were powerful. And, you know, this guy is crapping himself because the two two Jedi amongst all their droids are coming. Oh, we're going to die. No, it doesn't matter. We've got a whole army on the ship. <laughs> it's not going to make any difference. There's two Jedi. It's two of them. Even one would be hard. Two of them. No, we've no chance. Um, and it's awesome. It's absolutely awesome. And then they, they have to flee the ship. Fine, whatever. Um, and I'm not even going to place all the blame on Jar Jar Binks. He never should have been in it. But there were lots of things then. But not all of it. Of course, you know, how could it be bad? It wasn't bad. You know, the pod race itself was good action. Um, the the duel at the end with Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan against Darth Maul was fantastic. The, the music again, oh, as it always is, awesome, awesome. You know, so the film as a whole, wasn't bad. There were plot holes in it, which is never good. But you know, are we going to say there were no plot holes in the original trilogy? No, we're not. And um, But there were just bad features of it. And it's the same goes with episode two. Episode three redeemed itself in many respects, but it didn't completely. Uh, it's like they got all the good... Th they tried to cram all the good things that were coming, that were building up, all into the third one. It was a bit much, and they should have spread it out a more. But I don't say the prequels were bad. It's just they had bad things in them. And, and the reason I'm talking about this is because what I'm going to say about this film is all of the good things in the original trilogy are there in this film, this episode seven. They're there. All those elements. You know, the humour is awesome. It's absolutely just at the right time as well. And Han Solo fans, he gets some incredible lines. And Harrison Ford delivers them absolutely expertly. It's a joy to behold. And the other thing I'm going to say is, not only are all the good things that are, that were in the original trilogy present, those elements present in episode 7, but all the bad things in the prequels are completely absent. They're gone. And, and what are some of the bad things? First of all, annoying characters. There are no annoying characters. You know, there isn't a character that's there for comic relief. That, that I mean, that's what it, Jar Jar Binks was supposed to be the comic relief. It's a bad idea. Um, you shouldn't have a character for comic relief in a, in a story like this. You should have humour within the script, just naturally occurring. No single character that is just there as a clown. And that's what Jar Jar Binks was. There's was none of that. No characters were the clown in this. There was humour within the script itself, within the lines, with individual players. And other things that were bad. Um, now, the CGI, excessive use. Obviously, there's CGI in it. Used very well, as you'd expect, with the the scenes with the, the, the between fighters, X-Wings and TIE fighters and stuff like that. It's breathtaking. Absolutely fantastic. It almost made me wish I'd watched it in 3D. But I'm not a fan of 3D for it. I don't, don't see the point. Um... But they were spectacular. And I suppose it would have been spectacular in 3D as well. But CGI characters, you have to be a little bit careful. I'm not saying you can't use CGI characters. But don't overuse them. Don't use them for the sake of it. And in the prequels, George Lucas did. He used them for the sake of it. And they didn't in this. In this one, they're back to like fellas in costumes. And it looks really good. And, and it's just better. There is CGI as well. There's some of them are enhanced with CGI, and that works really well. Um, but it's not used excessively. It's only used where it works. That's the important thing. It only is used where it actually works. And the other thing, now that this might split opinion somewhat, is the lightsaber jewels. They were too showy. It was it was like balletic. The uh, 
the lightsaber duels in the prequels. It was all like jumping around. and It reminded me of Kermit the Frog at, in the fight scene at the end of Muppets Treasure Island. It actually, especially with Yoda and Dooku, it was like, this is a Muppet. This is actually a Muppet. You CGI Muppet, but it's still a Muppet. Literally it was, Frank Oz. But um, I didn't like that. I thought, no, this isn't this isn't good. It was just people jumping around, doing all sorts of flashy things, and you think, no. That's gone. It's proper realistic sword fighting again. Not people jumping around like fleas uh, and things like that. And it works much better. It's far more realistic. I know, I know it sounds silly to use the word like realism in high fantasy science fiction type film. But it does. It's it it's it feels like proper fighting again, proper lightsaber duels. Um and, and and still more it's still better, that's still an improvement on the way it was choreographed in the original ones, because of course technology is there to do that. But it didn't it didn't it's like I think George Lucas said, right, what can we do with the technology and let's really push the boundaries. Of course, as a director you're you're inclined to do that. But I think with this one they went, let's just make it, let's make it real. We use the technology to do things that we couldn't ordinarily do without it, but we're not using it just for the sake of using it. And that was absolutely awesome. The story itself absolutely carries, it's brilliant. There's a there's a couple of plot twists. There's one in particular that you could see coming a mile off. But I didn't believe they'd do it. I thought to myself, no, they're leading me, they're, they're trying to get me to think they're going to do this, and they're not at all because they won't do that. They won't do that. Oh my god, they've done that. Um, so I'm not going to say what it is, of course. Huge. It would be a huge spot. That would be unfair. But watch it. Um, but it, the fact that they did this thing shows to me that they've got balls as well. They're actually going to tell the story. They're not going to back away from difficult decisions. Uh, so it's an absolutely great story. It carries from start to finish. You can't wait to watch the next one. But also at the start, you never felt like it was going to drag. And uh, and and all those people that, that brought the kids and then at the start of the film got them a giant bottle of like Pepsi or something. And then of course, as you would, <laughs> it don't take a lot of working out, this is going to happen, had to take them to the toilets in the middle of the film. All those parents that were really wanting to see it themselves and you've missed something. Just go in for five minutes, you've missed major things and it's your fault. Next time, don't buy them the Pepsi. Um, <laughs> because there was no moment you could dare miss, and um, oh, it was yeah, it was absolutely brilliant. And I am just going to say, go and see it if you haven't already. I imagine a lot of you have seen it and think it's absolutely brilliant. But go and see it. Go and see it. It's worth. And if you're like me with most films, I usually wait a couple of weeks anyway, just for them to quiet down and then go at a quiet time, so I'm not bothered about people around me. Um, I was never going to do that in this case. And and I would suggest the same to you. Don't wait. Just go and see it now. And then go and see it as I will in a couple of weeks' time and, and, and watch it when it's quieter as well. I watch it. I mean, I watched episode one of Phantom Menace about four times, five times maybe. You sh you're damn right I'm going to watch this a few times as well. Because this is amazing. And and I want to watch it again and again. Uh, and when it comes out on DVD, I'll wear a hole in the DVD. <laughs> and Well, it's already got a hole, hasn't it? I don't have to do that. But um, massive thumbs up to me. All my fears completely dispelled. I have absolute faith that the next two will be great as well. And I am looking forward to it. The only disappointment is unlike Lord of the Rings. I don't think... I'm, I'm, I've not followed the production too closely. I don't think these are ones that are necessarily going to come out too quickly. I mean, Lord of the Rings, we didn't have very long to wait. Each one came out one year after the other. I mean... Star Wars films traditionally come out every three years, don't they? I'm not sure what's going to be the case with these, whether that's the same thing or not. I don't know. But anyway, uh, that's all from me. And until next time, and I make more Warcraft videos, which is what I normally do, I'll see you later.